Okay, good morning, everyone. I'm Sarah Bowman from Common Sense Media, the Senior Director in Los Angeles. And we are really thrilled to have you here today with us for another one of our Common Sense Conversations. We always do local conversations with our local audiences, and this is an online version uh, coming to you as an as a effort to help in this time of crisis, cobbling together all of our experts that we turn to for advice uh, all the time and particularly now. Um, and right now is crazy. We are all experiencing more screen time than ever. At Common Sense, we always advocate for a balanced approach to media. We love the wonderful things that we can access on our phones and our televisions, but we know how important it is to teach children how to manage the many devices that they have and all their communications options. Research-based parenting advice is in our DNA. The core of common sense is the idea of quality curation, that what you watch actually matters. It's our mission to help kids thrive today in this ever-changing landscape, and boy, is it changing, which is why we founded our nonprofit 16 years ago. And specifically, uh, in this time of crisis, we developed uh, something brand new called Wide Open School. We launched it two weeks ago. The URL is wideopenschool.org. And we have cobbled together, not cobbled together, stitched together this beautiful partnership with about 25 plus national content providers like Sesame Street, National Geographic, PBS Kids, Scholastic, Khan Academy, endless great organizations who are providing content for free for everyone to see on the site. It's a single stop resource for parents and educators who know that their kids are online more. It's a one stop place to go to get great stuff curated for you and your child's age group. So I just went on this morning to poke around because every day there's new detail, new content up there. And I found I was searching for middle school field trip and I found a web core webcam of Anne Frank's house. Um, you know, that's just kind of a nice conversation to be having if your kids are reading the book and it's just an easy way to one stop shopping to go find that particular special project. Uh, so when this webinar is over, I would love for you to go and spend some time on wideopenschool.org. So here's Kara. Kara is a longtime friend of Common Sense. Dr. Natterson's a pediatrician. Hello, hello. I'm so happy to see you today. Uh, yeah. Consultant at Worryproof Consulting, and she's a New York Times bestselling author of many books. Uh, the ones you might already know about are The Care and Keeping of You and Guide Stuff, which are sort of guides to what's going on particularly in the body of middle school puberty kids. She has a brand new book that came out in February called Decoding Boys, the New Science Behind the Subtle Art of Raising Sons. It's a great treatise on uh, thinking about what's going on in the minds of our sons as they're going through puberty, sort of un, un, turning over some uh, common, common myths that are, is really helpful. And we turn to Car all the time uh, at Common Sense. I turn to her personally, and um, I, I want to plug her newsletter actually right now, which I, I was not in the script, but I've been reading your newsletter, which is coming out more frequently than ever. And it provides an awful lot of science-based information about what's going on with this virus and then some you know, uh, medically, medical oriented stuff, but also helpful hints for parenting in this time. And I think when there's so much unvetted information out there as there is right now, it's important to rely on people like Cara for the science and, and trust what you're hearing from there. So what, a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. Um, everyone who's on the webinar is on mute, except for the two of us. Uh, we have enough people on there that we don't want to have live questions, but you can go to the chat box at the bottom of your screen and in the chat icon, ask your questions. Um, my colleague Melanie in New York is going to be sharing back information and monitoring the chat room. And my colleague here in LA, Lisa, is also on to uh, keep, keep us on track. And we will get to questions by the end, or if they're relevant in the middle, we'll sort of pepper them in. And if you can't stay on for the whole time, don't worry. Uh, we're going to put this up on YouTube and we have more videos coming, more webinars coming. So we'll keep you abreast of all that. So, Cara, we were on a webinar yesterday with a, um, uh, a psychologist in New York dealing specifically with young children, preschool age kids that are at home. And, you know, after the initial craziness of everybody at home and getting used to, um, you know, school and work at home, she said, kids are actually kind of settling in and kind of like it. And um, there's, there's a nice rhythm to the house. The kids don't have great social needs. So things are kind of 
calm down like a nice summer vacation for the children, maybe not for the parents. So I just thinking as we're talking about teenagers today, is that happening with teenagers? <laughs> um, let me just say, I totally see why it's happening with the younger kids. It makes a lot of sense to me. Uh, once they adjust into a new rhythm, they adjust into a new rhythm and they love the presence of their parents and they do like routine. So uh, by and large, so that, that piece of it makes sense. What I have seen over the last month is as the preschoolers and younger kids have kind of settled into a rhythm this way and it's worked as sort of a good upward trajectory, the teens, I feel like it's um, a little bit of a downward trajectory. I think it's going a little bit in the opposite direction. It's not that they're not managing it well. Um, I think by and large, as a generation, they are being remarkable. They are resilient and they are agile and they are doing a great job um, having their, their childhood interrupted. But what's tricky for them is that they are at a developmental stage, particularly the teenagers, where they are, it is not just that they are social animals, being social is a fundamental piece of their development. And right. so this longer stretch has started to feel like a different kind of isolation. The way my own daughter, who's 16, described it to me, and as I pass along this description, I get a lot of uh, agreement. She said, you can talk to your friends and connect with them through technology and it's incredible, but because we're not doing anything in the real world, there's nothing to talk about. Right. And that is the emptiness that I'm hearing from a lot of teenagers. And, um, and so it's not that they're not playing their role, by and large they are, but I think it's getting increasingly hard for them as opposed to increasingly easy. Oh, I like, I'm, I got a little teary thinking about that. I have older children, but just to think of this childhood being so terribly interrupted for these kids. And I actually feel that when I'm on a Zoom quarantine call or whatever, I'm like, okay, now we've talked about everything we're watching on TV. Right. <laughs> so it must be that much harder for them. Um, what about the kids who uh, aren't maybe like your daughter and aren't on their phone naturally with their friends and able to experience that sort of going over this curve to a new place of like, mm, I don't know that much to talk about anymore. What about the kids that didn't really start on that ramp? And, and how much are you meant to encourage a child that is not that social to begin with? Well, that's a really interesting question. So there are the kids that aren't that social, and then there are ki the kids whose parents have worked really, really hard to limit their time on devices because, mm -hmm. you know, between you at Common Sense and me and the world of pediatrics, we've all said for as long as I can remember that it's the it's the real life experiences that are so valuable. We don't we don't negate the the screen based experiences mm -hmm. at all, but those real life experiences. Um, we put a higher premium on them for a really long time, and now those are sort of going away. So I'll take that group first, which is the parents who have been more restrictive. Um, they are liberalizing. You guys have heard this. I have heard a lot about this. It is important to liberalize for those parents in order to foster the social connections for their kids. It doesn't mean you throw out all the rules, uh, but there are ways to liberalize social connections so that, um, so that kids can feel that um, that sort of um, inclusion that they need to feel or that bonding with other kids that they need to feel. Uh, my, my general guidelines here for those parents are please keep your rules uh, around keeping devices out of the bedroom at night. That's really, really critical. Right. Um, but during the day, you may uh, rethink some of the parameters you put around it. Now, when you look at the kids who are by nature not that social, um, you know, we we often use the word introvert, although introvert just means you get your energy from yourself. An extrovert means you get your energy from all the people around you. So you can be an introvert and still kind of social. Um, but for the kids who are both introverted and, so, and not so social, um, this is both um, wonderful because they do get a lot of energy from themselves. Um, and this is alienating. And um, for parents of those kids, I strongly recommend that you start engaging in conversations about how you can reach out to other kids. It doesn't have to be a lot of them. It, it could just be one or two, but try to build and foster connections that you might have had a, during the school day or you might have had um, on a team that uh, right now, th those, those relationships, those connections have to be a little more forced. 
Yeah, it is. This was an unexpected problem. Sorry. Unprofessional. Um, what about those kids that were on sports teams? That, that was often a way for those children to interact. And they not only are they not um, seeing their friends on the field, they're not getting exercise. And, and so there is this sense of it's hard to motivate kids to move right now. Never mind the profession, the kids that were playing sports for a team. Then you got the other kids that weren't moving, and that's part of mental health. How do you yeah, motivate I, that? Yeah, I actually think the kids who are part of formal teams have it a little easier because just like all the classes have moved to these tech platforms, Zoom and the like, a lot of teams have moved to those platforms as well. They're uh, maintaining the connections between and among the kids. And then they're also posting workouts that the kids can do and the coach is motivating the kids. So that structure of a team um, seems to continue for a lot of athletes across the country, albeit in a totally new way, but right. um, at least there's a framework for it. I think it's harder for the kids who are actually not part of a team. I think those kids who need to um, not only motivate themselves to move, but motivate themselves to move when they are very limited in how they can do that. Um, there are no parks to go to, at least in Southern California where we are. The parks are closed right now. Um, you know, there are, if you don't have certain equipment, if you don't have a bike that you can jump on and start riding, um, if you're not a runner and you don't have a safe neighborhood to run in, your options are really limited, but the options are not zero. So hula hooping, great form of exercise. Jump roping, great form of exercise. Um, there are all sorts of basic aerobic workouts that you can find online that involve push-ups and jumping jacks and all those sort of old school exercises. There are yoga classes online. Um, and then there are more intense training programs online for kids who are looking to dive into something new. And you can really hone your skills a little bit. It's right. a little lonely, but you can do it. Right. So there's a lot of resources online for that. And sort of following that line of questioning, um, you know, teenage years is the time we want to message about our bodies and the, and the health of our bodies from a physical point of view. But there's also the drinking and the drugs and the, and the messages about sexuality and smoking and all the things that parents, you know, don't really want to be ramming down their children's necks in terms because they're all in the house together. But it is a good time to talk about these kind of wellness things for when we get released back into the world. Totally. I, you know, I'm dying for the study to come out that looks at how risk-taking behaviors in teenagers has changed during the quarantine, because you can argue that, uh, you know, sexual experimentation has gone down dramatically, right? If kids are physically separated from one another, um, you know, I anticipate seeing that data. Um, but, you know, my kids and I talk about all the time, um, vaping was the most common conversation when we talk about risk behaviors of the past year. Right. And I don't believe that has gone to zero, right? Um, kids were addicted to nicotine at record numbers. So um, how has that panned out during this epidemic? And what do parents, how do parents engage their kids in conversations around not just risk behaviors and being proactive and getting in front of it, but maybe even what's going on under my own roof that I'm not seeing, right? And so the, this is new. This is brand new territory. I'm sitting here in front of my computer talking to you. My kids are in school across the house in a different room. Um, there's a lot of trust that goes on. Um, that, I think that's multiplied across millions of homes in America, especially for parents of older kids. Um, you know, how do you, how do you straddle just blindly trusting your kids and figuring they're doing uh, everything they're supposed to be doing during the day and sort of catching catching them where they want to be caught so you can have those hard conversations. Right, and, and from a health point of view, there is this sense that um, the stuff that makes COVID dangerous are, are things that you also wanna be, you know, they're sort of strengthening their general ideas of what is, keeps them healthy. Well, that's right. Um, and, you know, the, the lowest hanging fruit here is basic health and wellness. Mm -hmm. um, so I would encourage every parent to keep going back to the themes of Sleep is important. It's really important for our immune system. So sleep schedules should not be thrown out the window with coronavirus. Right. Um, basic nutrition is really critical. Um, and since we're all cooking all of our meals together or ordering our meals in together, um, parents probably have a better sense of how their kids are eating now than they did before. Exercise, as you mentioned, is critical. And frankly, hygiene. 
right? I mean, they got to take a shower. It doesn't matter that they're inside all day. It's really important. And how do you keep their spirits up if you see that they're starting to flag with some of this? Because there, there is the sense of like, okay, am I, is my kid just normally depressed because this is depressing and we're all, you know, in week five of this uh, versus where there are worrying signs? And when do you, you know, call yeah. somebody in for I that? I think that's the, the million dollar question right now. Um, it can be very, very difficult to tell the difference between um, depression that requires intervention and um, sort of this um, depression that is connected, it's not really clinical depression, but depression connected to these depressing circumstances that we're all in. Social uh, distancing uh, should not mean social isolation, but it often can feel that way. So um, there are a lot of really great resources online that help parents outline the difference between the two. Mm -hmm. um, they also throw in um, other comparisons like anxiety versus symptoms of coronavirus, which can actually look very similar. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, and I would point your, um, your common sense audience to the American Psychological Association that has really, really great links um, about all of these things. But um, don't forget that clinical depression, we, they're really tried and true symptoms of clinical depression. So these include um, sleep disturbance. If your kid cannot fall asleep and has developed insomnia or sleeps constantly, those are two extremes of sleep disturbance and they can go along with depression. Or um, eating disturbance, either a child who is not hungry and has totally lost their appetite or a child who is actually eating away their feelings and eating far more. Um, so there are these, um, and there is a, there's a whole laundry list, but they're, they're really um, tangible things that you can that's start helpful. with. That's, that's, that's satisfying. You know, that's yeah. um, I'm getting, I'm starting to get some questions from the audience in here and two that are a little bit connected. Um, uh, oh, this is while we're on vaping, this is from a viewer. If your teen can get off vaping during the pandemic and has been moderately addicted, what does withdrawal from nicotine look like in most cases? Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, it does. Nicotine withdrawal can uh, look like a whole host of things. And again, it's something I encourage people to look up on a, um, go to a, a medical website and you'll see a bullet pointed list, but um, withdrawal symptoms can include things like rebound headaches and agitation. And um, some kids can feel very sluggish because they're not getting that, um, that boost sure. that they often get with nicotine. Uh, but there's a whole laundry list that um, I would definitely look up and see if, if that's what your kid is doing. Um, I think it's really important to have direct conversations about nicotine. If you have a child who was vaping and they don't have access to nicotine right now and they have withdrawn, instead of ignoring it, talk about how great it is that they are not taking nicotine, putting nicotine into their body right now and identify the benefits of this moment, right? Um, that this moment gave them an opportunity to quit a habit unintentionally. It's great. It's the 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 downstream uh, benefits of that will be tremendous. So um, talk about it. Yeah, and I think obviously that's a risk for coronavirus. So there, you know, that's directly connected to. It's an opportunity that coronavirus shutdown has given them, but it's actually something that would hurt them, would make them more susceptible. So I think we, it's we, great. we think we there's no data, but I think it's really common sense. Right, so something you would tell, tell your child. Um, I think it's it's helpful to have there's there's a lot of resources online for these specific things with nicotine withdrawal, uh, depression, eating disorder, and then then you know there's the most parents are sort of in this bucket of like how do I deal with these other weird things like my kid seems a little bit blue they seem a little bit unmotivated they're going to miss their graduation they're not going to you know my case my child's not going to get married when she thought she was going to get married I mean there's these sort of you know, yes, it's a shame and, and it's hard to manage kids' expectations as they're growing up into the world. We, we want them to have this sort of nice childhood where things work out, but that's yeah, psychological yeah. territory. I have to venture a guess that the vast, vast majority of kids are living right there, right? Um, in this space of mild disappointment. And depending upon where they are in their um, life trajectory. Um, there's been a lot of talk about high school seniors and all right. of those landmark moments that they are going to miss. Um, right. And, you know, I think they are a good example of a group of kids who have every right to feel like it's the culminating moment and they're getting none of it. 
Um, but I've been really amazed by their awareness of the fact that, um, oh, okay, here's where we are. Right. It's, it's not like it happened to one person or to five people. It's happening to the entire country. And I think in a weird way, it feels better given those numbers. Um, parents do need to address it with their kids, right? Because um, the kids who are not able to process it and express it will bottle it up and it will come out in other ways. So um, I have one kid who's a talker and one kid who isn't. And the one who isn't, I find myself, it's like I'm pulling on a rope and pulling on a rope and just very slowly trying to, to show him that um, I care, I'm interested, I see that he's down, uh, let's talk about it, let's go there. Uh, there is a point in some households where you need help outside of the house. What's incredible about this moment is that um, mental health uh, specialists, whether they're therapists or school guidance counselors, they're more available than ever. Yeah. Because they, ha they do this, they're doing telemedicine and they are, you don't have to get to them anymore. And the reimbursement structure has shifted dramatically. So people have access both uh, sort of technologically and also financially. Oh, so it. take advantage. Right. Yeah. So you can have a teller, you can have a check in with a therapist and you don't, you're not driving after soccer practice and before you have to make dinner. And that's right. There's been, and there's, and there's more acceptance in general for the fact that this is a mental totally. health crisis. Yeah. Um, we have some specific questions coming, but I want to go back to this notion of this generation as a generation and trying to think of them looking forward. Um, they are the, the sort of, certainly the kids that are a little bit older than them, they're a very helpful generation. They're idealistic. They want to help the world. They, you know, want to buy a pair of glasses for themselves and for someone else. And how do, how can you help when you're stuck at home? I mean, it seems like a unique time to be uh, making yourself feel better by being able to go out and help people in the world, but we're limited in what we can do. What have you seen uh, families doing to remedy that? So there are actually a ton of ways. Um, I'm gonna give you a few examples, maybe it'll spark ideas. Um, one is mask making. Um, so whether you sew or whether you are just a tape and- 3D say, printer, yeah. Yep, yeah, 3D printer. So there are lots of ways to make gear. Um, and that, has, uh, that crafting push has been wonderful and makes people feel useful. Um, there's also, um, because tweens and teens and 20-somethings don't get as sick with coronavirus as older adults do. Not always, but for the most part. Um, there's uh, an argument that they should be doing the shopping and the sort of errand running for the older generation. Because, so um, I'll tell you, um, there are neighborhood networks that can be set up where um, kids who have bikes can offer to go to the grocery store and be the delivery mechanism for the groceries or go to the pharmacy and be the delivery mechanism for the pharmacy. In my neighborhood, there is a mom who um, is involved in some um, housing, subsidized housing uh, for folks that you know, before all this started, we're struggling. And she organized what's called One Can Wednesday, which is amazing. So she's asked everyone in the neighborhood every Wednesday to put one can out in front of their house. Yeah. And then a couple of the kids bike around and they pick up all the cans and they drop the cans off and she delivers them. So that's the kind of community-based movement where you feel like you're making a difference. Right. The biggest difference you can make, Sarah, is to stay home. I mean, I know it sounds yeah. powerless, but it's yeah. Yeah. very yeah. powerful. Well, and I do think that there's a sense that we'll have this collective um, sense of, of having done something together to turn this around. So, um, so that's without getting political. Um, so I think it's important to focus on those good things that you can do. The birthday parties you're seeing out there, the virtual, you know, the drive-bys and everything else. Um, and I think that's probably for parents, um, very protective behavior and, and something to do as well. Um, so I'm just looking a little bit at the questions. Um, sort of a little bit back to the motivation. We're getting a little bit of sense of, you know, addressing the, the kid that's in their room or that's watching too much negative news or how do you sort of help keep them away from the negative and get them a little bit out to the food drive? I mean. Right, exactly. Well, let's, let's just talk about screen use as opposed to screen time because I think that's a lot of it, right? So um, I've already said, and I'll just repeat it in case it didn't sink in. 
devices shouldn't live in the, in the room. Um, and it's mostly because if they're in there, they often get used. And when they are used, uh, the later it is into the night, uh, often the more kids, especially kids who are having trouble sleeping, kind of go down a rabbit hole. That rabbit hole, frankly, might be news. I mean, it, you know, we, we always think porn, porn, <laughs> you know, it's not necessarily porn. It could be just following this very long thread of scary information that's popping up. Um, and, and it is scary, but it is also, um, it's important for us to realize um, what is happening in the world around us. So I, I think it's very important for parents to teach their kids moderation on screens. In the same way we teach them moderation with eating junk, uh, moderation in terms of news consumption is as important. Um, for younger kids, you should absolutely be limiting their access. So the very youngest kids should not have free range on any device in the house. Those um, middle age, you know, middle school kids should have parental controls or self-imposed controls that come from conversations with parents so they can learn how to self-regulate that limit not just time, but also where they can go. And kids really like those guardrails being put up when it's in conversation with them. And then for the older kids, it's constant back and forth about, hey, what sites are you on? Let's talk about how you're spending your time. How many hours of news did you watch? How does it make you feel? Right? When, you, when I watch news for six hours a day, it stresses me out because this is what I'm hearing. Do you feel the same way? And you know, you and I both have kids who are at ages where when we've got it wrong, they'll tell us we've got it wrong. Yeah. Yeah. So if you're making an overcall and you think the news is creating stress for them, and in fact, it's empowering them with information, they'll let you know. Yeah, and I, I found I find in a lot of my conversations with other families, you have one person in the couple that's addicted to the news, and and the other person in the couple that wants to watch old movies. You know, I mean, there is this sense of um, moderation alone in the family, but again, that's a question of of modeling. That's correct. That's yeah. correct. Um, I also think it's tricky because we have all these hours at home now, and some parents are feeling like you know am I watching a movie every night with my kids? <laughs> is that the way that um, I'm marking the moment and making this fun, but it's a school night every night. And how do I balance that? Like, where's the, you know, in, in the old way, six weeks ago, a school night was a school night and a weekend was a weekend. And today it all blurs together and it gets confusing. And so uh, that speaks to how routine works in your home and the structure of your home. And um, that first week, all these parents were posting schedules. And uh, what I would recommend to people is, um, here we are, we're in month two, uh, you know, in, in LA now today in New York, they announced uh, we've got another month to go at least. So um, reassess, just right. re take stock, reassess, see how it's working for you, stick with the things that are working, throw out the things that weren't. Uh, do take a moment to have fun you, uh, because they will remember this. Um, this, yeah. is, this time is marked in all of our brains. So have a little fun if you can but um, also build some structure. Yeah, I love that idea of the do-over and the idea of like letting kids help decide, you know, what, what are the new roles? Like this can be your week to run or, you know, yeah. some sense of, um, okay, that was enough for that. Let's not go back. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Um, Except okay. bathroom cleaning. My kids would say that's enough of bathroom cleaning. And I'm like, no, nope, sorry. Well, still, we still have to clean the bathroom. I know. Yeah. But it's a chance for um, more chores to be done. I keep getting people sending me pictures of their children doing vacuuming. Uh, and there's a sense of parents having to do a lot less uh, concierging of their children, which has is, is got to be good for everyone. And when you think about um, as, as we ramp back out, I mean, how do you, part of sort of ramping back out would be to be having these conversations with your families about what you're liking, because some things we, we will be dying to chuck, but some things we want to keep. Yeah, I do hope that this um, reduction of snow plowing, helicoptering, concierging, whatever you want to call it, I do hope that that sticks. I think parents needed permission to let go of that. They sort of all right. agreed in principle that it was a bad idea, but secretly they were all continuing to do it to some extent, right. um, mostly because it is our job to, to sort of keep our kids safe and healthy. And we somehow confused that with um, living their lives for them in a very um, pres prescribed way. Um, so I, I hope we are able to hold on to that piece. 
Um, but you know, it, it is, it, this is, this is tricky, um, how this is going to look in six months from now and what we're going to retain and what we're not, no one knows. Um, I think, uh, I encourage parents to be the authors of their own narratives. If you are doing something in your house that feels really good to you, commit to retain it. So for me, with my kids, the amount of housework that's being achieved by my kids is unbelievable. I mean, it is, it, I feel like that is the one parenting win because I feel like I can send them out into the world now and they can actually take care of their own space. I'm going to fight to hold on to that. And it's going to be a fight. It's going to be a struggle. But um, it, it's really, I think, um, been a really great life skill to do your own laundry, right? And yeah. not rely upon someone else. Good for mom and, you know, they're all going to go to college, hopefully in a few years, and they have to be able to do that stuff. I, I've been consoling myself by thinking, okay, when I'm looking back on this time, I'm going to be angry if I didn't do X, Y, Z. And I don't mean learning a language, but I mean, you know, whether it's cleaning the linen closets, closets or talking to friends I haven't talked to for a long time, I'm trying to setting up those goals uh, that, I, that I have time to do now. And I think having that active conversation is helpful. What are you finding with your clients or people you're talking to uh, about programming this summer, thinking about the kids who are going to college, thinking about college in general? I mean, both in, as pertains to sort of doing the planning and also to whatever motivation might be slacking. So um, uh, no one knows anything right now. I mean, I know as much as everyone who's listening to this knows. Um, the sense is that most summer programs are being canceled um, and will live online or be postponed to 2021. Um, I'm sure there will be a little bit of flexibility in that. And as things open up a little bit, and then as we see what happens, because we know as we liberalize our rules, we will see another surge um, in viral spread. We just don't know what that surge will look like and we don't know how busy the hospitals will get and that will determine whether we have to shut down or scale back again. Um, so uh, there'll be, you know, some, some things will pop up here and there, but by and large, I think most people are planning to hunker down for the summer. I think the, the real uh, disappointment in terms of high school and college kids um, is the first job opportunity is pretty much gone. Um, college kids are feeling that pain much more than the high schoolers. The high schoolers, the, the job was to help put away money for college or to help pay for their own um, expenses. And I'm not uh, trying to diminish that, but for the college kids, uh, it was far more significant than that. So this shift where um, you know, our job numbers have gone crazy and jobs are really don't exist right now is hitting um, the college kids in particular um, in a very, very hard way. Um, and I think that's been um, really hard. It's been very disheartening for them. Um, so you both have no summer plans or no next year plans and no, no options right now. It feels very frustrating. The advice that I'm hearing most often is it will get better. I mean, we are looking at this at a moment in time where our society is essentially shut down. And so it will get better. But I don't know over what period of time. Um, and I don't know how quickly. And I don't know who's going back to school when. Although I have started to say to people, based on everything I'm hearing and reading, I suspect that K through 12 schools will go back sooner than colleges will. Because uh, I don't see how you can quickly shut down a college or a um, or a boarding school. Uh, you can't pull those kids out quickly. The logistics of it are very hard if we have to go back into a shutdown. So I think in terms of return to school life, it's going to be very bifurcated. You're going to see a slow return for local schools um, and a delayed return for remote schools. I could be wrong. Um, That's so interesting. Yeah, I know a lot of the big colleges had to spend a lot of time and money taking care of kids that didn't have somewhere to go. And that's both resources and time and, yeah. and health issues. So, yeah. um, so I guess all of this is about, again, things you can teach your kids during this time and that sort of sense of acknowledging the grieving that we are all actively going through is a life lesson. We're all going to have to learn how to grieve, um, but, but sort of trying to live in that moment. You know, people are having a hard time reading books. They can only really watch movies or, you know, it's hard to concentrate. It's hard to think past today. So I guess teaching your kids those life skills in terms of grieving and in terms of the one foot in front of the other. 
I think it's particularly hard because in the teenage brain, you know, the, the limbic system, which is the emotional part of the brain, the feel good risk reward part of the brain, that's totally mature and it's online and it sends and receives messages really quickly. But the prefrontal cortex, which is the part that really thinks consequentially and long term, that part is not fully mature and it's not going to be mature until we're close to 30. Some people say after 30. So what does that mean in terms of this current uh, moment of grief? Uh, I think we are asking kids to look ahead and their brains aren't necessarily wired that way. Their brains are very wired to think in the moment and feel in the moment and act in the moment. And the moment is very isolating. So um, you and I are able to project forward and we can see a path partly because we've lived longer, but partly because our brain is fully developed. And for younger kids, I think it's a big ask to say to them, look forward. That's really helpful. So you just have to keep repeating. <laughs> you can't like expect that to, to dig in for them. Right. No. And frankly, we've, none of us have ever been through this. So, yeah. you know, all we can do is say what we think is going to happen, but none of us can make any promises. Yeah. Um, so I was going to get into teenage romantic relationships, but we're going to actually do that next week with Shafia Zaloom. So people that want to know what their teenagers who are in love or wish they were in love were doing, Cara will have to come back to you on that, but Shafia will be dealing with that next week. Um, and I guess I would just want to leave it with a couple takeaways from you in terms of how both we manage it and how we help the kids manage it right now. Yeah. Um, well, I think that just like before the pandemic, the best way to manage anything with your kid is to talk it through. Mm -hmm. I still think the best way to manage anything with your kid is to talk it through. Yeah. Um, the difference is uh, what do we say and how do we say it? So um, some tips for parents. Um, first of all, open the lines of communication with your kids, which I've been hearing from people um, is a little bit easier now for many people because well, that's the point of your book also. Right. I mean, my, my whole book is about how boys shut their doors for some period of time when they go into puberty. And I will tell you in my own home and in many other homes across America, um, people are experiencing a little less of that from their sons. Maybe mm -hmm. it's that they're doing it the same amount, but they're here all the time. So it feels relatively less, but right. take advantage of that. And if you have the child who is not letting you in physically or emotionally, show up, put your device away, disconnect in the same way you would have before the pandemic and show up, knock at their door, talk to them, engage them. If they won't open the door, talk to them through the door, show your kid that you want to be connected. And frankly, because you're all in the same space and you're sort of living in these very close quarters, um, carve out time for each of you alone, but ritualize a time that all of you can actually come together because that becomes the sort of safe space for everyone to have a conversation. So the family meal has never been more accessible than it is right now. And I would, I would jump on it. Right. Fantastic. We're so grateful to have you in our life, Car, and advising us all along and, and uh, making, it, making it seem a little bit easier than it is. So, I mean, in a good way, giving us the tips we need. So uh, to everyone that's on, thank you so much for joining us. Please look at Wide Open Schools. Uh, definitely sign up for Car's newsletter, sign up for our newsletters, and consider making some donations to Common Sense Media because we are... Um, we're, we're fighting through this too and trying to provide as many resources as we can for you all. So Cara's Fantastic. book is called Decoding Boys. And Wide Open Schools, I just have to do a shout out. It's really remarkable. It is, if people haven't gone to the platform, go. If people haven't shared it with their schools, with their school heads or their deans, share it. I, I, you know, this, it is phenomenal. It is really phenomenal. Thank you. And, and, and definitely share it with your library, share it with um, any sort of institution that is uh, nonprofits that are dealing with their constituencies. It is free. It's accessible to everyone. And it's being, uh, we, it's only two weeks old. We're just gathering the best stuff from all over the place. We're sent so much information every day and it's been really fun to look at it. Um, so we're sharing the link for Cara's book, uh, on the chat for all you on zoom and we'll do a follow-up and everybody I, I always say go out there but don't go out there, <laughs> go out there. stay home stay safe
Stay home. Stay safe. Okay. Thank you, Cara. Thank you, everyone. Bye, guys. Thank you.